Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. The weekend has come once again. It is time for the Premier League predictions now for match week 17. Flying past this season. And after last week, you know, with the predictions, I'm quite ready to go back and do this week's predictions. Only managing the four points last week with four correct results predicted. That adds to our 102 um, points coming into that game week. Now taking us to 106 on the year and quite disappointed with my efforts, I've got to be honest with you guys. But this week, a chance to bounce back. A few very interesting games um, for the teams at the top and a derby in there as well. So a lot of interesting games to feast our eyes upon this weekend. Before we jump into it, guys, I appreciate all the support on these types of videos. But if you're new to the channel, if you wouldn't mind liking this video, subscribing to the Player's Own channel, and also sharing this channel and this video with mates who would enjoy it, that would be much appreciated. We've got po podcast content. We've got these sort of short form content as well. So a lot to face your eyes upon in that department there as well. That all being said, guys, let's get straight into this week's predictions. Our first game is Nottingham Forest who take on Spurs in what could prove to be a very interesting game there in the early kickoff. Nottingham Forest back at home fighting for their lives, fighting for their jobs career as well. Steve Cooper still under a lot of pressure. Save your job for another week after getting a one all draw versus Wolves. But if they get smacked up here by Tottenham, it could see the end of Steve Cooper, unfortunately. Like I said last week in that video, I still reckon he's one of the top managers in the Premier League. The way he turned around Forrest in the championship to get him up was very, very remarkable. And I think he's just been dealt a, you know, a bad hand here and the fact that he's had so many different players to deal with. But what I liked last week is he went back to his roots a bit. Ryan Yates in that midfield there, got Toffolo back in the lineup, Nico Williams at fullback as well, and went with a very dynamic front two of Morgan Gibbs White and Anthony Alanga. Those guys are your attacking options. I like to see Tayo on you when he's back in that lineup up top as well. He supplies you with the goals, but that's the way you're going to get at teams. On the counter attack, they're very, very dangerous. And against your Spurs side, they could pounce in that sort of high line that Spurs play. In terms of Forrest, you saw last week, I loved Ryan Yates. He was someone who worked so hard in that midfield and didn't allow Nottingham Forest to get overrun. They're not a team with high possession. They'll be average around that 38% possession mark. But if you've got someone like a Ryan Yates in there who's you know robust to a challenge but can get you going forward on the front foot, that's so important for this Nottingham Forest side. And you know that's where they're going to need to be, really, really strong in midfield to win the ball back and bit them be creative. But I think that's what Mangala... Um, lacks in there, that's what Murillo and Dominguez, all these guys who sort of come in there lack in that midfield area. They don't have that creativity that the likes of Ryan Yates can do. Nico Williams as well comes to the side and already is an impact there from fullback. He's someone who can also create and go into this you know back five sort of setup. I think gives them more chance to you know spring counter attacks and can get the balls into the wide areas to feed Gibbs White, to feed Anthony Alanga. But once again, they're going to, have to be very, very solid at the back. The take on the Spurs side coming off that 4-1 win over Newcastle. Feels like they're back once again. That midfield feels a bit like it was during that great run to start the season off. Really, really strong into tackles, but then springing the ball the other direction, swinging the play into Tottenham's hands and creating so much in midfield areas. Their wingers were high and wide. You got goals out of Richarlison. Look looked like it was Spurs at their best. And I think they'll carry that momentum, carry that performance into this game here. I can only see it going one way, and that's a Spurs win. I think they win this game three goals to one. They've got that defensive unit back. They've got the identity back in terms of their midfielders. I think that would be too much for Nottingham Forest in this game. Our next game is on the south coast. It is Bournemouth who hosts Luton. Two teams who we thought would be towards the bottom end of the table, but Bournemouth are doing their best to stretch away from that bottom three or four positions here. Another massive win in the weekend, beating Manchester United three goals to nil, whilst their um, team they're facing got a very, very tough, unfortunate 2-1 loss to Manchester City. Touching on Bournemouth first, I continue to be impressed by Andre Iriola and his side. Continues to play this more front-footed brand of football, exciting, expansive brand of football, and it's getting results now. And we're seeing the game totally come together, really strong at the back, whether it be Senesi, Kirkes at the back, really solid into their challenges. Great versus Manchester United, especially in the first 25 minutes where the Red Devils were on top. And then in forward areas, I keep talking about this front four, but Semenyo, Solanke, um, Clivert in there, 
And then you've also got Tavernier on the flanks as well. These front four are just ridiculous. They're clinical in front of goal. They create, they score their own chances. And in terms of pace and accuracy, there's not too many front threes, front fours, much better than these sort of guys in the league. Really young players, players that can you know, get into their stronger foot and can you know, fizz a ball into the bottom corner or into the top corner. And I have to touch on Solanke again. Dominic Solanke, for me, has been the player sort of standing out for them this season, but one of the most standout shock players of the whole season. We know what he's about. We know he's a solid poaching sort of striker, but now that we're seeing Bournemouth playing this bit more expansive style of football, on the front foot a bit more and creating more chances, we're seeing Dominic Solanke finishing off more of these chances and getting into these better areas. And the finish on the weekend to make it 1-0, it comes from Lewis Cook pressing up. It comes from this pressing style of play that Bournemouth have, but then the cross into the box and Solanke's little, you know, taint little touch there to knock it in the back of the net into the far corner just goes to show the quality that this guy has you got billing coming off the bench scoring and overall this team just looks great they've gone and got 13 points in the last five games the only draw coming against aston villa where i thought they threw away that result there as well so you know they're playing really really good football and back at home versus the luton side who they've drawn a liverpool five weeks back i think now uh, five games back, they take it to the top two teams in Arsenal and in Manchester City in the space of a week as well. But that was all done at home, away from home. We know that they haven't been as strong, um, get that sort of boost with playing at home, and I think they miss out on that going away. The last result away from home was a 3-1 tough loss to Brentford. They didn't really play their best football. Rod Edwards, though, you know, got his side to be really robust, really tight-knit in terms of defence, defend very narrow and protect the box. And that's what they've done in recent weeks. They've relied a lot on Ross Barkley, Andros Townsend, uh, and Morris and Brown up top there in terms of creating things and having that ability to spark counter-attacks and get these chances out of nothing. But against this Bournemouth side, I can only see this game going one way, and that's a Bournemouth win. I've got them winning this game, three goals to nil, back at home. Our next game takes us to London is Chelsea hosting Sheffield United. And I've got to do that. So look, it's an interesting sort of game. It's a hard sort of prediction. I'm not sure the way this game's going to go. Chelsea have been so hit and miss this season and a really tough last week. Obviously, the 2-1 loss to Manchester United. We know how poor they have been in recent weeks. On top of a 2-0 loss to Everton as well, where, yeah, they might have won the midfield battle and controlled possession, but... In terms of clear-cut chances, there wasn't many of them. And then when you've got the likes of the forwards they've got, like Sterling, Mudrick, and Nicholas Jackson, it's hard to see the ball going into the back of the net. And then Everton and the other end were clinical, and they just they got killed in that department there. They go back home. A lot of pressure on Mauricio Pochettino to get something right here. This Chelsea team has really, really struggled this season in terms of scoring goals. Their expected goals have been up there with one of the best in the Premier League, but scoring them is a different sort of <laughs> result in itself. And in recent weeks, they seem to be leaking a fair few goals. Their defense was probably their most solid part of their game, but now it's become you know, a bit shaky at times. They lose Reese James as well to another soft tissue injury. So that adds to their problems at the back as well. But they come against the Sheffield United side. He got another inspirational win under Chris Wilder last week, his first win at the helm. It's good to see them playing that more aggressive style of football, back to what we got used to them playing under Wilder in those sort of COVID days, getting on the front foot, um, you know, pouncing a press on teams at times and making that home ground a bit of a fortress there uh, at Bramble Lane. They really bossed that game versus Brentford, played really, really good in periods. And then they can take this across this Chelsea team because they're vulnerable as well. If you can spring some, you know, high presses on them, we saw they were a bit dodgy in terms of their passing at the back against Manchester United, you might be able to nick something from this game. I still reckon though Chelsea need to bounce back and that's why they get the win here. I've got this win in this game, two goals to one, purely because they're at home, purely because they need, they have to get a win. Otherwise, if they lose this game here, Mauricio Pochettino could be the next manager sacked in the Premier League. Our next game is in Manchester. It is Manchester City hosting Crystal Palace. Another very interesting affair in terms that Manchester City, despite coming off a 2-1 win versus Luton, they still haven't looked at their best yet. They're missing Haaland, they're missing Kevin De Bruyne. They're missing these top quality talents, I understand that. But this team shouldn't be scraping a 2-1 win versus Luton. I talked about it on the podcast, and I think it's very interesting to see that their goals came from turnovers or high presses up the ground to get Luton out of possession. 
and that led to their goals rather than a really slow you know, control build up and break a team down. So it's clear to see that front sort of four um, five positions aren't quite working at their best currently. They need a new spark in there. They need something to be created, something to happen. Julian Alvarez you know, is getting more involved, but still seems to be lacking that confidence and form from the start of the season. And, and we've seen against Aston Villa the game prior, they just got totally outplayed. So when teams get at uh, Man City and don't be afraid of them, I feel like that's the best opportunity you got to beat them. I said that in previous videos as well. You know, the respect, you know, you have to be respect Man City, but you can't over respect them in the fact that you just sit in and sit in and sit in and absorb pressure because that's when they can you know, ping passes around six, seven, eight pass chain and, and break you apart. So for Crystal Palace, that's where they have to get at them. You know, in this game though, that's where it's probably going to happen. Those passing plays that midfield area because Crystal Palace really took it at Liverpool last week. They had to really get a result after some poor results in the middle of the week. They came out there with that intensity, with that effort and with that you know ferocity in midfield led by Obviously, Will Hughes in there and supported by Jefferson Lerma. Those two are really robust combat and combative type two in midfield that look to get into challenges, be aggressive. And that fueled their whole side versus Liverpool. They probably played the best part of the game in the first 45, 50 minutes where they got on top of Liverpool. The red calf and Jordan Ayew really hurt, it, hurt them in that game. And in my mind, probably led to Liverpool winning that game of football. But you know, I was really happy to see what Crystal Palace did there. And if they can come with that same sort of mentality versus the Man City side away, I know it's a big deal and a big effort to go to the Etihad and play that style of football. But if you can try and you know, call that across there to City to be that sort of robust, you know, narrow side to try and protect those central areas, force City out wide, force them and cross us into the box and try and prevent that with your great you know, centre-back partnership of Gay and Anderson, that's where you can try and get a result here versus Man City. They do concede goals as well, and that's why, you know, just all the good things that about Palace. I know Man City will look to bounce back and put in one of those great performances at home. I've got them winning this game three goals to one. I still reckon Palace can have a part of the play in this game. They could score a goal. You know that City leak goals at times and I think that's where Crystal Palace can maybe potentially look to get a result at this game. Maybe a 1-1 draw for them but I can only see this going in City's favour. As I said, a 3-1 win for the Citizens. The next game keeps us up north. Newcastle host Fulham in this game. Interesting one. Newcastle, a much better performance midweek versus Milan in the Champions League. They unfortunately they get knocked out after drawing that game. They finish bottom of their group, but they've got to bounce back. They've got to bounce back in a big way, especially in the Premier League. After being 4-1 by Tottenham last time out, they need to come back and, and put a better performance in. They come up against a Fulham side though, who are in probably their best form of the season and one of the form sides currently in the Premier League. They're playing some great football and scoring goals for fun. 10 goals in their last two games, uh, five nil duos at home in their last two games as well. Raul Jimenez is back in the goals. Andreas Pereira is playing great football. And a big one for me is Alex Awobi back on the flank and back performing at a high level. You know, he can tuck in a midfield and make it a more um, so sort of defensive, supportive type of player, but it can also go back to that wide position, use a bit of his pace and his passing to create chances. And we know what Jao Polinia does as well. So this midfield battle is going to be massive, like most Premier League games are, but especially this one here. You've got Miley, Joe Linton, Bruno Guimaraes versus you know, a really, really up-and-coming side in terms of their midfield production. And Jao Polinia, Andres Pereira, Tom Kearney, or maybe uh, Reid might be in that midfield. And that's where this game would likely be won and lost. You know, the creation for the forwards. Both sides have very clinical front threes at this current point in time, but it's about who can feed them more and who can you know, create the more chances for their front threes. Both back uh, both back forwards are normally very, very solid. Newcastles have had more mistakes than recently, especially Kieran Trippio, who's had a rough sort of last three to four games. So I expect him to bounce back. It's up there in Newcastle, and that's why I can see them getting over the line just. It's going to be a very tight game, I think. I've got Newcastle winning this game two goals to one. But again, with the form Fulham's in, it could swing their way as well. Next game is Burnley at home versus Everton. Burnley, obviously, in some improved performances in recent weeks, especially their 1-1 draw last time out versus Brighton and Hovell in a different style of game. They absorbed more pressure. They played a bit more on the counter-attack, and you saw they got a result. I hope they can carry that over into different games this season. Might not work, though, against this side they come up against in Everton, who are probably the form side of the competition. A 2-0 win versus Chelsea last time out. 
and putting together some great performances in recent weeks. You know, outside of that 3-0 loss to Manchester United, they've gone on another three-game win streak and continue to put together great performances. It would be 10th in the Premier League if I haven't had that 10-point deduction in the league. So it goes to show that they are in great form and are our top side. The Corre back on the goals once again on the weekend. He is their top scorer for this side and a really key performer to watch out for if you're Burnley. Someone who can create from a deeper midfield position in terms of winning the ball back, but then also can be that sort of false nine in behind Dominic Calvert-Lewin to score some goals for them as well. They've been so good in that midfield area with Adrissa Garner gay um, as someone who's missing. You've also got Onano midfield as well. And then you've also got De Decore as well. So all these sort of players in this area, you got Jack Harrison and McNeil from wide areas who create chances and can score in their own right. There's just so much good things happening from Everton and I feel like it all comes from that midfield five, midfield four in there. They're someone you have to shut down for Burnley. Burnley's midfield have also been good in recent weeks and Johan Goodmanson and Sander Berger have also really stood up for them in their improved performances as well. So once again, another game where both midfields are going to hope, hopefully decide the outcome of this game. In terms of the result, I think Everton still get the win though. I've got them winning this game three goals to one. Too much quality, too much great form and too many good vibes right now at the club. They'll keep rolling and they'll beat Burnley in this game. Our next game is West Ham versus Wolves. West Ham back at home after a tough 5-0 loss last time out versus Fulham. But you can never know what happens with West Ham. They're the most up and down team currently in the Premier League, I feel like. Good result, bad result, good result, bad result. It always feels like... And David Moyes, from one week to the next, looks like one of the best managers and then one of the worst managers. But if you know West Ham, you know how good they can be at home and you know how they like to bounce back. So I expect them to produce a better performance this time out versus the Wolves side, who are probably quite disappointed. They only um, got a point versus Nottingham Forest last time out. We know how good they've been at home and are really disappointing not to convert on that last time out versus Forest. I think they'll also put up a better performance, but I can't see this game having much excitement. Both teams like to play on the counter attack and are normally really, really solid in terms of not conceding many chances and you know, scraping points and results out of games. So not going to be the best game to watch in terms of the on the eye, but it could be interesting in terms of how these two teams match up against each other. I can only see this game going one way, and that's a 1-1 one -one draw. Um, you know, you've got Huang and um, Cunha for one team, but you've got Paqueta, you got Bowen, you got um, Kudus for another. It's you know really really special attackers inside of two teams that don't sort of play within themselves and don't go too much in the front foot. So yeah, a bit of a ball this one. I've got a one-one draw. Our next game takes us back to London. It's Brentford hosting Aston Villa, and unfortunately this is a bit of a slam dunk type game. One of, I guess, a few this weekend, but this one especially. Brentford, I like the way they play their football at times, but they just haven't quite had that spark this season, especially at home, um, in and out of form, unable to get results, and just keep showing patches in games, 20 to 30 minutes of good football, but they can't sustain it for long periods of time. And with a lack of a focal sort of striking option and coming off the back of a really tough 1-0 loss to Sheffield United, it doesn't get much easier as they verse and up and about Aston Villa side who Colin done two one nils last week over the two, I guess, top two in the Premier League in the fact that they got the win over City, they got the win over Arsenal. Both games at home, however, their form travels no matter where they go right now. Really, really impressed the way they're playing their football. Luca Digne has been very impressive from fullback. I expect him to have a bit of a field day in the fact that Brentford will likely sit in and sit in a narrower shape. Expect Matty Cash to come back into the lineup as well. These fullbacks will be very important into you know creating chances for Villa because as I said, I expect Brentford to overload the central areas, compact that area, and not allow the, the Villa midfield and the Villa central striker and you know, Ollie Watkins there to get on top of them. So Diaby um, for the flanks, um, you know, as well as these fullbacks. Uh, it will be very important. And then also Leon Bailey, who was the spark plug last week for them versus those top two sides. I expect these sort of players to get on top in this game. And unfortunately, you can only see this game going one way. I think Villa win this game quite comfortably, three goals to nil. A penultimate game of the weekend keeps us in London. Arsenal return home to play Brighton. And obviously on the back of a very, very disappointing 1-0 loss to Aston Villa. They dropped a second in the Premier League 
with their second loss of the season, but they'll look to bounce back here versus Brighton. We know that Arsenal are really good at so far this season at grinding out results or getting results where it didn't seem likely. But I'm yet to see Arsenal at their true be best yet. I don't think we've seen the best of them. We've seen signs, we've seen patches, but we haven't seen a full 90 minutes or back-to-back -back games of playing a high level of football. Yet they're still in a title race. They're still at right, right at the tip, top end of the ladder. You know, especially last time out. Martin Erdegaard, Martinelli and Saka. All these guys, I think, underperformed. I guess, no, probably underperformed is the wrong word. They just weren't clinical enough. They had some chance to score, especially Erdegaard. We just couldn't convert them. You know, they got unlucky with a you know penalty shout and a handball shout against Havertz going against them. But again, they didn't perform at a level. I thought they absolutely bossed the game versus Aston Villa. Yeah, I think they looked to bounce back in this game. Obviously, Mikel Arteta will be back on the sidelines. I expect them to be hungry for another result here. And I think they'll get the better of Brighton side, who right now, once again, a 1-1 draw to Burnley at home isn't the way you want to be talking about Brighton right now. I get a lot of transfers in and out of the club. I get, you know, they've had an unstable starting 11, but performances haven't been good enough. A lot of possession, a lot of meaningless possession, and little chances being created. I like Jao Pedro and Evan Ferguson as a pairing up top as a, as a number nine and a, and a 10 there in behind. But these guys are clinical, but you've got to give them chances to score. You know, they're not creating enough clear-cut opportunities right now. Outside of Gross and Hinshelwood, there's not much chance creation coming from midfield. It's all these sort of fullbacks that are creating chances. And it's Matoma only solo runs, so he's going to create goals as well. But outside of that, they look very, very toothless in the final third. They look like a team right now that has an identity, but the identity isn't going to get them enough goals. And against an Arsenal side at the Emirates, you've got to need some goals to compete with them, especially how good they are at the back. I can only see this game going one way, and that's an Arsenal win. I've got them win this game two goals to nil. That brings us to our final game, which is Manchester United, who travel up to face Liverpool. Uh, the Northern Derby, but unfortunately, this game's gonna go one way. It's probably the easiest decision to make all weekend. This game's had so much history in the past, but in the last few years, it's been one way, especially at Anfield, with Liverpool winning. And I think this game's gonna go the same sort of direction. Liverpool, top of the league right now, the kings of comebacks, but I don't think they'll be coming from behind in this game here. Manchester United right now look just deplorable. Um, poor Champions League showing, knocked out of their group coming last, but then the worst thing of all last week versus Bournemouth on the back of a very solid performance versus Chelsea. You'd expect them to kick on and use another great performance, but it was very, very poor. The first 20, 25 minutes were great, but outside of that, really lacking creativity, lacking chances and missing some big players in this game here. The likes of Maguire, Shaw, Casemiro, Fernandez, potentially Marcus Rashford as well will all be missing. It's this team just falling apart it feels like and hit rock bottom right now and this is the worst time to play a Liverpool side who are probably on the top of the world coming off that 2-1 comeback result salad breaking history and it could be more history made here I'm being generous in my prediction um, after last year's 7-0 I'm backing Liverpool in 5-0 winners in this game I think it's going to be one, one way running and I can't see Manchester United supplying much defensive cover to stop this ramp at Liverpool side So that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to an end here for the predictions for match day 17. Some big games, some interesting games, a few sort of slam dunk type games as well. We expect teams to get on top. But that's the that's the famous art of the Premier League that no game is ever easy. No game ever goes to plan. There's always a, another <laughs> sentence to be written in the script or another twist to the tail. That's what the Premier League delivers us week in, week out. Let's hope I can get more than four prediction points this week. Let's hope we can bounce back, back to those eight-point weeks I've had the two weekends prior to that. That ball being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please make sure to smash a like on it if you did. Subscribe to the Player's Own channel also and share this video with mates. Um, it will really help me out as we continue to push here during this Christmas period. As I said again, Christmas period of the Premier League, super exciting games. feels like every second day. So keep tuned in on the channel for our podcast, for the prediction videos, as I'll be pumping this out over this very busy period. With that all being said, guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the weekend's football action, and I'll see you for another video very, very soon. Until then, guys, see you later.